Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you all, and welcome to the Global Diaspora Summit, Diaspora Social Capital Technical Working Group. My name is Geneve Brown Metzger, and I'm president of the American Caribbean Maritime Foundation in the United States. I had the pleasure of serving as Jamaica's Consul General in New York for several years, and a chunk of my focus was on the Jamaican diaspora. It was my honor also to have served on the think tank of the first global diaspora conference hosted by the United States uh, State Department in Washington in 2010, with the likes of Kingsley Aiken, CEO of the Networking Institute based in Dublin. And I'm equally honored to be moderating the session today and very much looking forward to hearing and learning from the experts and attendees. As a moderator, I will keep time order and ensure that as many questions and comments as possible for, from the audience are answered. Bear with me, please. The standard house rules, uh, all microphones are to be muted, apart from the speaker, of course. Courteous language. No Chris Rocking or Will Smith stuff happening here today. And to the speakers, we kindly emphasize your adherence to time limits to ensure sufficient scope for attendee engagement. For attendees, please post your questions in the chat. We ask you to please mute your microphone during the presentations. And of course, remember to unmute them during the discussion period, something I've already aired on. So we are all there. We encourage you to participate and invite your active reflections on the questions posed. Now to the substance. As you will see from the agenda, the four technical working groups are based upon the concept of diaspora capital. Diaspora capital, as defined by the Networking Institute, relates to the overseas resources available to a country, region, city, organization, or location. And it is made up of flows of people, networks, finance, ideas, attitudes, and concerns for places of origin, ancestry, or affinity. In short, flows of people, knowledge, and money. Mobilizing this capital comes through the IOM's 3E strategy to engage, enable, and empower diaspora communities. So whilst the technical working groups collectively engage the four types of diaspora, capital identified by OMS experience in the field, our focus today in this technical working group is on diaspora social capital. I hope you got all of that. Took me a while to uh, go it over. What do we mean by diaspora social capital, we will ask? Well, that is defined as the networks of relationships among people who live and work in a particular society, enabling that society to function effectively. What do we mean? What do we want to discuss in this technical group, working group? We would want to look at specific themes related to social capital of diaspora and how this can contribute to development. Therefore, key areas include political participation in both countries of ancestry, origin and residence, and civic participation, including through civil society organizations. Let's also try to remind ourselves that the Global Diaspora Summit is not just about taking stock of where we are, but also being ambitious in our visions for the future of diaspora engagement throughout uh, the future agenda document. So let's embrace this ambition to think big and to think bravely on the great expertise around our virtual network. Can we come up with concrete recommendations that can help our national and international leadership to shape future actions in engagement of diaspora social capital? We have a bit of a process to help us think this through. Our aim today is to address four of rather three key questions that engage the policy, programmatic, and partnership future of diaspora engagement. Policy. Well, what can the future agenda document recommend at a, at a policy level to achieve global collaborative action on diaspora social capital? We'll come back to these questions later in the, in, in the process. Let me end by saying, this is what we're here to achieve today. And let's face it, we want our TWG to be the best one of them all. Do you all agree with that? So I'm delighted as you're moderated to facilitate the next few hours where we can design a meaningful future for diaspora engagement in diaspora social capital.
the next voice you will hear will be uh, the first speaker for this uh, session. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce, well, I first, first say that Germany is our session host, and it is my pleasure now to introduce Stefan Angus Heister, Policy Advisor at German Federal Chancery. At the Federal Chancellery, Stefan is responsible for the international affairs of the Commissioner for Migration, Refugees and Integration. In his previous position at the Federal Foreign Office, he helped shape the external dimension of EU migration policy, particularly for the MENA region. Stefan will speak for 10 minutes to address the importance of diaspora social capital and to provide some thought leadership on the subject, as well as to share some best practice sessions learned and visions for the future. Stefan, you're up. Thank you so much to me for a kind introduction. Um, I, I want to keep my time short today um, as uh, over here in Berlin, it's uh, 5.40 p.m. Uh, on, a, on a Friday. So um, I don't want to keep you for too long. Um, let me first uh, thank you, Janine, for, for the introduction. And of course, uh, it, is, it is an honor to have the opportunity to speak here today at this outstanding conference. Um, I've seen some of the sessions before and, and the exchange have been uh, quite insightful and um, the Global Diaspora Summit as a whole presents this excellent opportunity to foster international cooperation and exchange um, regarding, um, of course, the goal of uh, the goal 19 of the Global Compact for Migration. Um, Together with, with all of these experts and practitioners here today, uh, I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Um, I want to follow suit previous speakers in previous sessions in that I, of course, thank the government of Ireland and IOM for putting together this high level event um, that demonstrates quite clearly the strong support for the initiative to strengthen diaspora engagement. Now, Germany is, of course, committed to fully implement the GCM in, its, uh, uh, in respect to all of its 23 goals, um, including Goal 19. Diaspora organizations are a pillar of sustainability, and that goes for sustainable development, that goes for social inclusion, that goes for sustainable political participation, and that goes for transnational dialogue. Diaspora organizations are also critical as local supporters in times of crises such as these. The consequences of the unprovoked attack on Ukraine, Putin's war, highlight the importance of Ukrainian diaspora in Europe and here in Germany as well for our efforts to host and support millions of refugees in Europe. Without their incredible support from day one, we couldn't have done it and we continue to need each other's support in this. Now, this session discusses diaspora and social capital. Uh, and Geneve has, has, has sort of taken that away from me already by, by laying out the IOM definition on what social capital means. But I want to want to repeat it real quick. The networks of relationships um, among people who live and work in a particular society, enabling that society to function effectively. That's what IOM defines it as. Now, this may be a quite broad definition, um, but it still reminded me when I first read it instantly of one of our, our focus areas here at the Federal Chancellery, namely mm, the one that I would like to highlight, diaspora engagement in the context of integration and social inclusion, in particular the potential in the context of pre-departure integration measures. Now that may sound a little bit technical, but I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the concept. Germany aims to facilitate regular migration as much as possible and assist those who have decided to come in meeting their requirements and prepare arrival appropriately before their departure. Diaspora organizations hold a significant yet mostly untapped potential of social capital in this context. As bridge builders, they offer both know-how and the relevant network for such assistance. That is why the Commissioner for Migration, Refugees and Integration, Ms. Reem Alabali Radovan here at the Federal Chancery is making pre-departure orientation in cooperation with diaspora engagement, a cornerstone of her term at the Federal Chancellery. Pre-departure orientation is not just about the language, it's about 
information on local institutions here in Germany, registration processes, visa questions. It's about managing expectations before arrival. It's about the social and political participation. And it's about so much more that needs addressing prior to leaving the country of origin. And what better way to convey all of these messages and provide all of this information than through diaspora organizations who have, let's say, an, a bonus when it comes to trust for people who come from their country of origin and who have such a wealth of experience as well of exactly that what migrants in their countries are looking for before coming to Germany or to any other country. Our first impressions in this and our studies that we have conducted so far corroborate this. We have already launched a pilot in Turkey um, in close cooperation with the Turkish and Syrian diaspora uh, for family members who, who follow those who have already arrived in Germany. This will get us started in the field and we will soon expand our cooperation, um, especially with IOM in this field. Germany has been an immigration country for quite some time now, but we want to turn it into a modern immigration country. And we feel that this is part of the solution and our coalition agreement of the new government that took office in, this, uh, in December uh, last year um, highlights that focus on, on, on this area. So now um, I look forward to the discussion, uh, a fruitful conference, and of course I remain at your disposal and uh, thank you all very much for your kind attention. Back to you, Geneve, I guess. Yes. Thank you very much, Stefan. You, you helped me out there. I did not have to prompt you. I was trying to figure out how to say your time is up. So thank you very much for abiding by the time. But you made an interesting point, which I'm sure we'll hear more about today, how this Russian war has really posed for us. Uh, the activities and importance of, of, of diaspora in all its forms, social, political, economic, and otherwise. It is my pleasure now to turn over to the man of the hour, uh, somebody who's keeping me straight, uh, Roberto Cancel, Regional Specialist for the IOM, to present the background paper. Can you all confirm that you can see the presentation? Yes. Yes? Okay. Thank yes. you very much, Geneve. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Thank you, Stefan, for those uh, excellent opening remarks. Um, I'll try to go quickly because it's a lot to cover in the time allotted. Um, but just to, um, to let everybody know, I've shared the link to the background paper in the chat for those that didn't get the opportunity to look at it um, ahead of time. Um, basically, we've tried to put together uh, in this uh, background paper different experiences, examples, and case studies uh, regarding diaspora social capital that could hopefully help to inform the discussions today and to stimulate uh, some of the some new ideas on, on the topic. Just to, to reframe, again, we're talking about the uh, Objective 19 of the Global Compact, which speaks to uh, creating conditions for migrants and diaspora to fully contribute to sustainable development in all countries. And in terms of social capital, uh, one of the commitments under this objective uh, specifically speaks to enabling political participation and engagement of migrants in their countries of origin, including in peace and reconciliation processes, in elections and political reforms, such as by establishing voting registries for citizens abroad and by parliamentary representation in accordance with national legislation. So we'll see actually in this paper, many of those topics, how they've been taken up by different countries. Um, and just to, to highlight that th this is one of the commitments within the, the Global Compact. Uh, here again is the definition of social capital. Uh, both Geneve and, and Stefan did a great job sharing that, so I'll move on. Um, and following the structure of the background paper, we're going to first look at social capital in terms of countries of origin and then uh, in terms of countries of residence. Um, so as the, the reference to the Global Compact may have demonstrated one of the topics uh, within task with social capital is political participation 
And one of the points in the paper is uh, refers to the balance between uh, one side responding to the demand of members of diaspora to have a voice in political processes, especially those that directly influence them and their ability to engage with their country. Um, that balance to uh, against over politicizing engagement, which could often be a barrier or can alienate certain groups within diasporas. Um, so that that's a very fine balance, and, and many countries have taken different approaches or used different tools to try to achieve that balance. And some are shared here through the different case studies. Um, one approach is through structured dialogues, and we provide the case study of Tunisia that has a uh, Tunisian diasporal dialogue. Another is through consultative councils, uh, one or many consultative councils. And again, the, here the case study of Albanian Diaspora Coordination Council is given, um, but others exist around the world. Uruguay uses a similar uh, system as well. Um, and parliamentary representation is also given as an example with the case study of the French National Assembly. But again, uh, other countries have this as well. Ecuador um, is one from, from the region where I currently am. Um, and then uh, one of the things to note in terms of diaspora political participation is often this is based on citizenship. So that to some degree uh, excludes part of our broader definition or broader concept of diaspora, which includes those that no longer have the citizenship because perhaps they have nationalized another country and have had to uh, lose their original citizenship or second and third generations that lived abroad, that were born abroad and may not have right to the uh, citizenship of the country of origin. Another aspect of, uh, of social capital is communications, and especially uh, important is ensuring that there's reliable information reaching members of diaspora, especially today, as we know, uh, there's increasing vulnerability. Chi 进行网上的沟通，除了技术之外呢，还可以使用媒体。我们可以有一些案例，通过嗯，比如说菲律宾的政府，通过媒体给移民问题更多的关注。除了这些之外呢，还可以通过一些关系的建立来提高移民的社会资本，也可以更多的与政府进行合作。要找出可以与哪些移民进行合作。要找出可以与哪些移民进行合作。Also，for 全球的一些事物的合作 
other kind of ties. And the case study here is um, the Intel investment of $22 billion in Ireland, which was helped by um, Irish uh, diasporas in the company. Another example uh, could be the avionics industry in Morocco that benefited from having a Moroccan vice president in Boeing um, many years ago. Uh, and in terms of the governments, uh, they can actually use diaspora to help their economic diplomacy, leveraging embassies and consulates to support these networks. Um, and a very important issue which has come up throughout our regional consultations is that the diaspora engagement is not just about asking what diasporas can do for us, but also what we can do for them, and in specific, supporting the, vulner the most vulnerable in those communities. So there's a balance between engaging the successful and supporting the vulnerable. And uh, COVID-19 pandemic, of course, has demonstrated how those countries that have invested in frameworks were able to more quickly respond and provide support to uh, their vulnerable communities abroad. And the case study here, also from Ireland, our host uh, government for this uh, event, the summit, uh, is the Irish Government Emigrant Support Programme. So just some preliminary reflections in terms of countries of origin. Um, number one, to ensure legislative framework and procedures are developed to support the political inputs of diaspora communities. Uh, to provide, number two, to provide both financial and non-financial investments in diaspora organizations and networks. Uh, number three, commit to a dual framework of engagement that both enables overachievers, but also supports the most vulnerable. Four, establish key partnerships to ensure ongoing engagement of vulnerable diaspora. And five, create meaningful and symbolic awards that recognize uh, and recognition tools for uh, to communicate the pride in diaspora impacts. We move then to countries of residence, where advocacy and policy vision are one of the topics, um, where the uh, diaspora social capital can be employed by countries of a resident, uh, residence for local community development, but also for foreign policy goals, for example, around economic diplomacy. Um, and the important part of this is providing access to these groups to the decision-making process in the country. An example here is the case study of the all-party parliamentary group on migration refugees in the UK. Political and civic leadership is important for countries of residence. And here there's an increasing recognition and embrace of the dual or multiple senses of identity in civic and political leadership. And also it raises the point of structured bodies that facilitate these kinds of uh, leadership roles, such as chambers of commerce, diaspora organizations, and international business councils. The case study here, the US India based Business Council. And then looking ahead in the post-pandemic world of empowerment, we see that during the pandemic, many diaspora communities were on the front line and countries of destination can use this along with the fact that many diaspora communities have been separated from their home for over, for over the last few years to really um, build on the sense of belonging and loyalty in the country of residence and to help diasporas be more active agents of change, both in the country of origin and in their adopted homeland. And the case study here being um, a small grants program that was implemented by the IOM office in Washington, D.C. So preliminary reflections on countries of residence. Uh, number one, um, to commit to activities to further integrate diaspora social capital as contributor to social and political cohesion in countries of residence. So looking at that local uh, community development side. Number two, develop support and develop support financial and non-financial. Uh, sorry, develop financial non-financial support to create peer-to-peer -peer networks between diaspora civil leaders and domestic civil leaders. Number three, commit to legislative and policy reforms to embrace diaspora social capital and domestic uh, development and sectoral plans. Number four, create tools to amplify the voice and participation of diaspora, social capital and public consultations. And five, embed diaspora diplomacy, including engagement of diasporas and country residents as a key pillar of domestic enforced policy agenda. So to finish, 
We have some three overarching recommendations, one at the policy level, which is prioritize diaspora social capital inputs in policy developments and implementation processes in countries of origin and residence. On the programmatic side, uh, we talk, uh, we recommend diaspora capital, social capital engagements should enhance the operational and leadership capacities of diaspora civil society networks and organizations in line with contemporary expectations of such opportunities to promote full uh, further formalization of these uh, social capital engagements. And on partnerships, uh, we suggest that diaspora social capital engagements should be embedded in non-government, uh, uh, sorry, must embed non-governmental service providers to ensure access to key marginalized members of the diaspora. These will include partnerships with civil society actors, foundations, international organizations, and research partners. And with that, I finish, and I think within my allotted time. Thank you very much. You yielded a good uh, two minutes back to the floor, Roberto. Thank you very much for that uh, illuminating our presentation. It's quite interesting that two, I suppose, um, major events happening globally, certainly Russia's war in Ukraine and the pandemic have provided opportunities, unfortunately, to really see diaspora in its full-fledged activation, social, economic, and political, if I dare say. So thank you very much for that. I'm sure we'll hear more along those lines later on in the presentations and discussions. Uh, this portion uh, of the session encompasses short presentations to reflect findings from regional consultations held in advance of this conference. Each speaker is allotted five minutes to provide his or her feedback. And in order to save time, each speaker will hand over to the next. I'll be keeping time, of course. Luckily, this is a virtual uh, uh, session. And so uh, anyone going over the time will have escaped my glare, which uh, can be um, a challenge. Now, allow me please to introduce the panelists. First to speak is Laura Rola, Regional Specialist for IOM. She will be followed, of course, by the representative of Latin America, Cinzia de Santis, uh, in the UK, CEO of Healing Venezuela. And the third and final speaker is Professor Delali Badasu. I'm not sure if he has checked in, if he hasn't, his uh, presentation will be made by Roberta Cancel. So please uh, welcome Laura to the to the floor to the to the floor. Muchas gracias. Eh, estoy entonces ahora sí eh, compartiendo mi Thank pantalla. You. I'm sharing my screen now to give my presentation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Laura Roya. I am a coordinator of the regional project for the diaspora in in the the Buenos Aires office of the IOM. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm very glad to present this these inputs. And they were done uh, in the through the con regional consultation within the South American consultation, and we also had the participation of the regional conference of, uh, that was recently held. In that sense, uh, the considerations, the political considerations that I'm going to present in terms of the, our input have got to do with the uh, company, the actual intergen intergenerational change. So the contributions of the uh, second and third uh, diaspora generations need to be considered from a point of view that is programmatic so that we can actually uh, they can actually be included in different programs also generating uh, um, the participation of civil society whether it's in the country of origin or whether it's the country of residence is something that has to be done uh, through governmental channels. And also, we've been looking at uh, how to motivate political participation. And uh, what stands out is being able to vote from overseas. If you allow me, 
I will go on to the next slide. I want to keep the time as well. So in terms of the programmatic considerations, the first point that we came to was to actually look at the all the different contributions and ideas from the young populations. Also, we look focused on uh, promoting the the highest, uh, uh, the, the most the, the workforce that was the most well qualified of the migrant community. The yeah, last uh, point. There seems to be a third point here that's missing. It was the actual was the actual inclusion of the actors and the associations. They actually pro promote ideas and and these partners um, had a, a diaspora um, diplomacy um, from people, and it was from diaspora both in the country of origin and the country of residence, and the. The main points for empowering the diaspora social capital had to do with these points that you can actually see in front of you, such as strengthening uh, the networks through the improvement of consular uh, registries. This was considered to be key in terms of in, all, in terms of actually making use of good information also to accompany migrant communities to, to defend their labor rights. After that, we the, another priority was to allocate resources to actually accompany the educational processes of the, of the diaspora populations. And finally, another priority was the need to actually advance collaboration between the consulates and the local civil society in terms of actually addressing very specific problems uh, that the diaspora communities had. Well, uh, respecting time and, uh, and thanking you for the time you've given me, I would like to uh, um, tie, up, clue up, um, uh, tie up and go on to uh, Cynthia De Santos, who's in the United uh, Kingdom. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Laura, um, for uh, the explanation and actually the presentation. I can see we have uh, lots of things in common. So I represent the European, Asia and Pacific region, a vast region, not only geographically, but also diverse in every, in every sense. Uh, even so, we could find some, um, let's say, uh, common trends uh, when we were trying to define an ideal diaspora engagement novel, model in the region. Uh, there were, the participants were from uh, countries that have the very mature, mature diasporas. Okay, so sorry, there's something, a glitch, probably. Um, so basically, just to continue with the conversation. So we found some common trends, uh, even if we had such a di diverse uh, diaspora, group of diaspora. From a policy point of view, in an ideal world, countries of origin and residence should both consider diaspora engagement as an opportunity for symbiosis, for learning, and for advancing. But it's also a responsibility. Policies in an ideal world, again, should be bilateral, bilateral agreement between countries of origin and residence that includes the right to vote, rights to work, rights to education, to health and welfare, pretty much what Lara was talking about as well. And it, it, national development strategies should include also diaspora input because of the richness that the diaspora can bring to the table. It was a general sense, though, that even if there are very good um, examples and there are very good papers written, often the agreements are not uh, follow through. So a little bit more action uh, is needed. Uh, from a program's point of view, there have been some tools put in place to give diaspora a stronger sense of agency in the governance of the country of residence. 
and to allow diaspora to follow the journey of the countries of origin. And we had some really nice examples from Scandinavian countries uh, with the African diaspora, Turkey, the Philippines, Bosnia, Afghanistan and Timor-Leste. And I would like just to mention uh, Portugal because actually Portugal has a very well-established diaspora, very well organized, and they were the first to implement the global compact in response to COVID. And actually it's now proven that, that com the commission that they uh, put in place, the national commission that they put in place is actually proving very useful now with uh, the Ukrainian crisis. In terms of actors, of course, governments are key, but also uh, diaspora groups, civil society, international diaspora networks, such as iDiaspora, GDC, DMAC, and OIM are very important because they can guide, give visibility and credibility to diasporas. Now, uh, the key recommendations from this group were, first of all, capacity building is extremely important. Uh, there is a lot of goodwill and good energy, but the response sometimes from the diaspora can be disorganized. So we need some minimum common standards that we can go work together. Climate change resilience is absolutely vital to be introduced in the conversation about diaspora, because in particular those countries that are already being impacted, it's very important the exchange of technology. And migrants should be and can be science and development ambassadors. So to add environmental expertise and technology, these are two areas where the diaspora can play a key role to increase resilience. Another very important point that Lara also mentioned is diaspora youth. We need to engage with the next generations uh, to focus on communication and also investment opportunities in their country of origin. And in that sense, uh, Georgia and Ireland had very good examples. Finally, um, shared best practices. But the last message from the group was that above all, what is needed for diaspora to flourish is peace. So with that, I'll pass the word to Professor Delali Badasu and apologies for the interruption, technological interruptions. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, we can yeah. hear and see you. Yeah, my my internet is so unstable, I cannot use the video for long. So I just show my face <laughs> and Good. then I turn off the video. I hope everybody can see me now so I can turn off the video. So um, I'm from University of Ghana. And I've been working with IOM for a very long time, consultancy and other related activities. Um, talking about social capital, I have five minutes. Is that not it? Yes. Only five minutes. Five okay. Minutes. Yes, Professor. Okay. We had a national level discussion and also regional before today. The social capital we're talking about usually um, is something which should be positive. People depend on social capital to overcome challenges that they may have and also to support others. So even businesses which do not have any linkages or networks are less likely to prosper compared to those which have. And therefore, the individual, the diaspora needs social capital. When they arrive at their destination, those who are close to them or members of their ethnic or whatever group would help them to integrate into the labor market and also do anything that is related to their success as much as possible. Those who are individuals, lonely, lone rages are more likely to face more challenges than those who have networks um, and therefore social capital. We also know that those who have these social networks, that's what we have discussed, should not be taken as having the capital only at their destination. They may have the capital at their origin, linking them to family, friends, or associations. And in fact, 
if you would like to read Mazukato, it's a very short uh, study about how Ghanaians in the Netherlands who have family, friends, and other networks doing so many things for them have reported in the, her study better success, freedom, and also a free mind to carry on their work. So fostering, for example, is a huge social capital for Ghanaians. They leave their children behind, so they join them later. And somebody's taking care of them. They use remittances to do that. They also have somebody building their houses if they want to put up a house at their origin or taking care of their business. So we have transnational businesses among Ghanaian diaspora and also other West African diaspora. And these businesses may not be managed by themselves, but by relative or any other person. So these are just examples that we discussed. Social capital is very important at the destination and also at the origin. And we ended by also pointing out that social capital may not always be positive. It's the networks which have encouraged so much irregular migration, at least from the countries that we represent, West African countries. When people have networks and can depend on them, instead of getting documents to travel with, they are more likely to be regular migrants than those who do not have such networks. And I was involved in a few such studies. And we realized that some in Africa have networks, even in Asia, and they are able to use them to migrate irregularly. They use them also negatively to do human trafficking or smuggling of migrants. And for that reason, we should not look at social capital as only positive, but also negative. And therefore we need to manage that aspect. Thank you very much. I hope I've used only five minutes. <laughs> oh, yeah, have I are. got some minutes left? You're absolutely fine, Professor Badasu. Thank you to all the presenters. I certainly learned a lot here, and I'm really chomping at the bit to hear the questions and comments later on in the session. Uh, and that's where we are right now. Um, it, it's, it's interesting to me how the diaspora space has emerged uh, over the last 15 years, uh, really. Uh, and. Uh, Although there are many similarities among diaspora experiences, there are also unique uh, differences and dynamics that keep us, you know, ch checking uh, our assumptions and um, reminding us that there remains a lot to learn. This journey brings us together for sessions like this, and we have we leave, I hope, uh, more enriched and excited about the work we do. And uh, now I am happy and pleased to open the floor to discussion. Let me just say a few things about that. We have an hour for this. We'll be like to remind you that this is an interactive uh, exercise and to encourage your active, um, your active engagement. Remember to post your, your comments and questions in the chat function and to mute your mic, please, um, when you're not speaking. For this last bit, we'll focus on three primary questions and we have allotted 20 minutes, 20 minutes of discussion on each of these questions. The, the purpose of, of, of this session is to gather insight from you to help inform policy and the final future agenda document of the summit. So we get a little academic at this point, uh, just to remind you to really keep your comments succinct and to the point. That said, here's the first question, which relates, uh, relates to policy. What can the future agenda document recommend at a policy level to achieve global collaborative action on diaspora social capital? What can the future agenda document recommend at a policy level to achieve global collaborative action 
Global Collaborative Action on Diaspora Social Capital. Uh, we're waiting for questions. Let Juan and I uh, prime the pump and start with mine. Is that all right? Is that all right, Roberto? Okay. Um, in serving as Consul General, I was always up against what policy was I being guided by, by the government of Jamaica? And what was driving the diaspora movement on the ground in the 33 states that I represented? And I got to tell you that it was not always smooth sailing. They didn't always come together. The objectives and the perspectives did not always come together. The government, the diaspora saw themselves as, you know, being managed by a heavy hand by the government. And the government saw the diaspora as uh, being unwieldy and not the fact that they were not living in the country meant that they had fewer rights. I would like to see governments think through and come up with a policy that accommodates diasporans' engagement in the policy shaping on certain issues. I wouldn't say voting because there are all sorts of you know machinations where that is concerned. You don't live there, so you can't you know why should why should you have the right to vote? But I think, as we all know, as you know from from this session today and working in this space, that you don't have to vote to have an impact. So, but I think there needs to be more clarity on the policy level of how, to what extent can we engage our diaspora viewpoints, perspective on certain specific policy decisions and even giving us a right to vote on those policies. Any thoughts? Kingsley, I know you have a lot to say about this. I see you there. And if there's a hand up from Suela Kalia. Janine. Um, why don't we let the woman go first, if you don't mind? Proper uh, order. Beauty, beauty before age and in proper order. Suela? Thank you so much. And uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Rikens, for taking <laughs> taking the, uh, the turn. Um, I really appreciate this session because I found many, uh, also many inputs from uh, currently our countries. I am uh, based in Albania. I'm an advisor within GIZ Albania for uh, uh, returning experts and diaspora cooperation. And uh, actually, I it was uh, um, I was glad to hear from uh, Mr. Council uh, with regard to the um, mechanism which was set up in Albania in terms of uh, political participation of diaspora, which is the National Coordination Council, Diaspora Coordination Council. Um, I just wanted to give a short input with regard to the some practical contributions that was that was given by this uh, council which was established a few years ago. Uh, there were two very particular situations in Albania which involved them very di directly and uh, the government could see the impact and the need for having such a cooperation uh, with the diaspora, and namely during an earthquake we had in 2019 and of course also during the pandemic situation uh, because in these two uh, difficult situations for the country, um, the successful diaspora in terms of also financial successful diaspora but not only financial, uh, the let's say the highly skilled diaspora, they could provide uh, humanitarian but also social uh, knowledge on how to uh, how to deal with these two situations and to uh, let's say to um, allocate resources in the proper way and also to be on the field and to support uh, different uh, ministries uh, on how to re rebuild the let's Let's say the to reconstruct, let's say the, the the economic and the social situations. And in the case of the pandemic, there was a very successful knowledge exchange between the medical diaspora, the Albanian medical diaspora worldwide. 
uh, and the uh, local uh, health uh, um, representatives, uh, which showed up the, this very big need to have uh, uh, exchange of knowledge between the two parties in order to best overcome uh, uh, very difficult situations. So uh, this was, so, sorry for making it too long, this was just to give some practical uh, examples. And with regard to the question that was um, um, introduced Used by um, Mrs. Metzger. Um, what I would in, uh, also, being uh, myself a returnee, I am a former diaspora member and uh, since four years back in Albania and contributing to this. Uh, to the sector, uh, what I think it should be uh, on the attention of the um, institutions, of the local institutions, is first of all the attitude towards diaspora, uh, at least speaking from the Albanian context, there is still uh, prejudices and a lack of openness and fear, fear now, uh, I mean feeling afraid of involving diaspora, uh, as sometimes this uh, uh, has been seen as a third power, like competition, uh, and this has some sometimes limited uh, the exchange of. Um, uh, of knowledge or, or economic uh, relations or social relations uh, between the Albanians uh, in the country and Albanians abroad, and I would all I like always to uh, to remind what Mr. Eikens has already uh, many times repeated in its speeches, like there is no competition in this sector, in the sense that everybody can uh, can have can give a contribution and everybody needs to have the. Uh, um, um, I mean, everybody needs to have benefits from the other side in terms of development. So uh, I Bella, think openness. Well, could I could I just ask you if you would? I think we have the sense of what you're saying. We have until twelve thirty nine, so we would like to include others, other comments. Uh, thank you very much for your input, Kingsley. I think you were up next. Well, um, thank you, and thank you, Suela. You, you know, <laughs> you actually gave my point, which is that I, I think we always, we all have to work on the tensions which exist between diasporas, uh, the home and the host country. Because think about this phrase: you often hear this phrase, "The best and the brightest have left our country." So. If you stayed, what does that mean you are? Not good, not bright? You know? so, so you have to be very careful. And I think there's always a tension between home and host country, between people who stay and people who go. Uh, and we've got to be careful in our language and not say that, you know, the best have left. You know, the best have stayed, the best have left, there's good and bad all over the place. I think in terms of the future agenda, the kind of the policy uh, level you want to achieve, I mean, we're talking about global collaborative action. And I mentioned this in a previous session. I think it's important that maybe the, the future agenda sets out the notion of having having a, a kind of a, a depository of knowledge, in that there be one place that we can all go from all countries and learn about what's happening in different countries. I mean, lots of the programs are quite similar in quite, quite similar areas. Lots of our discussions and debates are quite similar, but yet we don't collaborate and cooperate as much as we should. And as Suela said, and I've often said, it's a non-competitive industry. You know, we're not competing with each other. So there should be this kind of openness. So I think a little bit of a mind, mindset change in terms of how we regard the diaspora and how they regard us. And how do you begin to break that down? I think through, you know, increasing um, interchange. Um, you know, when India, you know, there was a, looked at their diaspora around the year 2002, and they had a high level commission of the Indian diaspora, who spent a couple of years traveling around the world and wrote a report. It's about 700 pages and you can Google it. You could read it tonight before you go to bed. And it's um, it basically what came out of that study was that the diaspora didn't trust India. They distrusted India. There was a lack of trust. There was, a, there was some really difficult relationships there. And that's what India set out to repair and to create this sense of global Indianness, which is a really interesting notion. And that's the difference between the state, which is kind of lines on a map, and the nation, which is kind of a global notion. So here in Ireland, you know, we're a small little island off an island where it rains a lot. But, but we think of ourselves as the epicenter of an enormous empire. So we're a small island at the center of the world, we think. We're full of it. And, uh, you know, there's so many of us when 
left this 10 million people left this country. That's the bad news. But the good news is it actually has, is an empire not built by military might or force of arms. We don't, we haven't invaded anybody for the last thousand years. We've no plans in the future to invade anywhere. But we have invaded in a kind of a funny sort of um sort of insidious way through our through our, our diaspora. And that then becomes an extraordinary kind of potential empire which is an empire not built by, as I said, people shooting and fighting, but just by the fact that we have so many resources around the world. And I think that's the exciting thing for all of the people on this call, all the people at this conference, is that we all have these empires. And it's not just the countries of empires, but the provinces and the towns and the cities and the villages have little empires all over the place. So I'd say, um, yeah, if we could work on that building, breaking down those tensions. Um, and the best way to do that is to get diaspora to come back and to meet to, to meet and interchange. And we, we started these high-level conferences and commissions. That's what India started, actually. They have a conference in January every year of about 3,000 uh, Indians who are leaders in the diaspora around the world come back. So, so that's an interesting challenge. And maybe that might be reflected in the future agenda. That and the depository of knowledge. Does that make sense, Judy? Yeah, thank you for that, Kingsley. In fact, um, one of the challenges, I think, with all the Asper, certain, certainly what I see in the Caribbean, is this lack of this place where you can go to learn about what everybody else is doing. I know that's what your institute certainly started to do, is doing when you established that years ago. And uh, for example, one of the thoughts I had when I was in office was something like a Jameric Corps, you know, an, an organization that brought the diaspora, which oftentimes is bigger than the, the population in the country. I mean, there are more Jamaicans outside of Jamaica than they are. So the government really doesn't want to come, us to come back home. They couldn't fit us, <laughs> physically fit us, much less, you know, have the social services to accommodate us. So to think about that empire thinking notion is really a brilliant one. But beyond thinking about it, you also posit an idea to, to create a destination for all that information, that context that can bring us together where we can begin to not only work together, like in a Jameric Corps, but share ideas across borders. I think that that is, that is really important uh, point. We have really a few more minutes on this question. We have nine minutes. And I'm sure there's a lot more out there that uh, persons are shy to, to speak about. I would love to hear how uh, the Ghanaian um, um, diaspora is going from Professor Badassu, but I see that her mic is... What about Venezuelans, um, Cynthia? Hello? Oh, Professor Badassu, she is there. Yes, Hi, Professor. I, I was inquiring about your experience in Ghana. The diaspora? Yes, on the question on the question of um, you know recommendations at the policy level on social on the aspect social capital, not broadly, just you know on the policy level, how can we look at? Okay, so if if I may stress again the fact that social capital is good, it provides networks that are on businesses, networks that support well-being or uh, contribute to well-being of the diaspora. So networks are good. And even the government of Ghana, we drafting the diaspora policy. And one of the recommendations is that all Ghanaians living at destinations where there are quite a number should try and belong to a, an association, ethnic, religious, professional, old students union and all that. So that is recognized, but we also have this concern, as I said, that some networks contribute negatively to the well-being of the migrant, even those who have not yet left the country, the networks, the kinds of networks they may join can lead to trafficking or any kind of vice. So government should manage networks as they are managing migration itself. It should be an area where government would uh, have to put in the experts, uh, research and all that to see how they can address some of the evils that we get from networks. Very interesting. Uh, Cynthia? 
I think you were trying to say something before. Yes, thank you. Yes, I hope that the technology helps this time. Well, I actually, I am a dual diaspora because I first moved from Italy to Venezuela and then moved from Venezuela to the UK. So I can see the differences of between countries of origin is really striking. So the Venezuelan diaspora suffers a little bit of what Roberto was talking about, uh, the politicization of the diaspora. And that creates a sense of distrust in the diaspora, not only from the country of origin, which sees us as the enemy, really, because most of us left for political reasons, but also has an obstacle. Uh, so it's very difficult for her, for even the humanitarian sector, like, like um, uh, you know, the, the space where Healing Venezuela works. It's very hard to get to, to, to work with the government. But one recommendation that I would give is a way to create a space of neutrality for the diaspora. So for a future agenda, I would be happy to work with my, the government of my country in humanitarian things, even if I am totally against the political mindset of, uh, of, the, go of the government. But the, but the neutrality, and I'm prepared to, to, let's say, swallow hard, uh, uh, but also the neutrality needs to be both ways, you know? And they need to understand that actually what we're trying to do is to help the country. We're not going to change the regime or whatever. We just want really to help our, our people. That's a good point. I know Kingsley is up next. This political neutrality is very important because a lot of diaspora thinking is governed by who is in politics. And if your person, if your horse is not riding, you know, riding first at that time, then you somehow get marginalized if you are, you know, perceived as being on the other point. So that's a very, that's an excellent point, that issue of political neutrality. Kingsley, you have your hand up. Uh, no, I, I meant to take it down. Apologies. Okay. All right, um, we have um, five minutes left here on this session, but let's not force it, let's move on to uh, the next question. Um, I should also remind you that if possible, if you can post your questions in the chat, that would really help to ensure that um, we, we move along uh, smoothly. The next question goes to program. We'll also have 20 minutes for this discussion. What can the future agenda document recommend in terms of programs for diaspora engagement in the context of diaspora social capital? So what can future agenda document recommend in terms of programs for diaspora engagement under the theme of diaspora social capital? Find some of what we said before it might have overlapped the whole idea of uh, um, terms of reference with respect to engagement. Uh, you know, it, it's a little bit of a process question. Um, I find that there are diasporans, in, certainly in the Jamaican experience, who would never darken the door of the consulate, would never show up to, you know, political event, or would never even attend a quote-unquote diaspora event. They're out there making money, you know, doing whatever they do, but they want to be engaged. The question is, I guess part of this for me is I'm hearing, you know, how do we engage them and how do we help uh, to um, facilitate that, that engagement? Any thoughts? Stefan. Uh, I think uh, Professor Badasu raised her hand before me. I don't want to... Really? I didn't see that. Maybe I'm not seeing everybody that's on I, here. Um, she may have not taken it down. I'm not sure. You can go first, and then I come. Okay. Thank you so much, <laughs> Professor. Um, I think that's a very interesting question. I mean, when it when it comes to engaging with, with diaspora, we've made um, a wealth of experience over the last couple of years, I'd say. Um, I, it, it, the, the, I guess the answer is, is, is always it depends. Uh, we've we've made great experiences with um, engaging with diaspora when uh, in, in in terms of just lowering the 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 entry bar, right? So so very low key first um, connections to diaspora engage uh, organizations that are not yet so engaged. Um, 
in order to you know provide a safe space to to set that first contact and then move from there um we've we've made it a priority even over the last four years um to to engage uh, to 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 increase participatory and deliberative processes with diaspora organizations um from 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 other countries of origin here in germany to to engage with with their perspective and of course it it, it has been challenged or it was it was not always as easy but but like i said lowering the 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 bar lowering um sort of the entry to to discussion um and 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 reaching out on a lower level first has um has helped us involving them in in the processes that we've taken up to to engage with diaspora organizations how would help me understand help us understand what you mean when you say lowering the bar so for example um over the last four years we have um pursued what we call the national action plan for integration and it's uh, we made it a point that it's a very um deliberative and participatory process uh, that engages all parts of civil society including of course first and foremost diaspora organizations however when it's when you know it, it sometimes it has a certain connotation collaborating so closely with the government for diaspora organizations they 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 feel it could have a, a certain you know they feel if if they haven't been engaged in government work before it it can be a little bit overwhelming so so not engaging them in in the major process from from day one but rather you know have face to face consultations first on on a working level rather than the the leadership level um that helped us get a lot of organizations on board That's meeting meeting the diaspora and where he or she is uh just yep. to be consistent with with kingsley saying watch how we talk about our diasporans lower in the bar yeah diasporans are brilliant people so we are meeting them where they're at kind of in the american context yes i think that's one dr uh, professor badasu you had your your next very much i witnessed something in italy which i think may be good for uh, diaspora anywhere uh, the ghanians in italy decided to have a congress knowing that everybody may not be able to come and some people don't just fancy associational life so they asked every association to send representatives so it became something like a parliament where the voices of uh, diaspora uh, represented by the executives and i think if government can then work with the executives through their embassies it can be a way of engaging the diaspora through the executives and we also know that some of these things are gender uh, biased usually the leadership of the um associations are males usually and females who uh, not want to be in leadership position but if we have female wings of some of these associations um is likely to be interesting to the females we also know that governments need to support some of these organizations not financially but in terms of recognition um if for example independence day or republic day you invite the youth for example to do something they may introduce the chairperson or something is all a way of engaging them socially the, the interaction is so important then as they grow up they want to become part of the country so it should be that top down kind of um policy but engaging them so in the process they are able to also participate thank you thank you dr badasu kingsley 
Yeah, and I, I'm a big believer in sort of letting a thousand flowers bloom. In other words, let lots and lots of diaspora organizations kind of emerge. And out of that, there will be, become some which are more effective than others. So, so what then can home governments do? I think that um, the important thing is capacity building of these organizations, trying to build up these organizations. Because to me, having looked at so many of them around the world, you need three things to be a successful diaspora organization. You need a great case, powerfully articulated. And most people have a good case, sometimes more powerfully articulated than others. It depends. Then you need a constituency. So that means you be able to have to be able to answer the question about your diaspora. Who are they? Where are they? What are they doing? They're the three fundamental questions. And then the third thing for a successful diaspora organization is you need leadership. But if you ask me which of those three is most important, I'd say it's the last one. It's leadership. People follow leaders. So I think countries, home countries, can spend some energy and time and expertise and maybe money is actually training these people in, in, in helping them become better leaders, in uh, you know supporting them uh, both financially and otherwise. I think the role of government should really be kind of facilitators rather than implementers, by and large, not always, but by and large. Um, so I think that that's the key, is finding people who can step up and become leaders of diaspora organizations and drive them forward. Thank you for that. I, I think I have a feeling that Cynthia wants to say something about this because she talked about this uh, space, uh, this neutral space, and where you have all of the components that you just artfully spoke about. What happens many times, maybe it happens not so much in Europe, but more in the de developing world, is that the politics begin to define who the leadership is. Is that your experience, Cynthia? So whoever is in government, you'll find that their people or who supports them will come to the top. And when that government goes out of power, then somehow that group and that, you know, those individuals are marginalized. So this business of political neutrality when it comes to diaspora, to me, is one of the strongest takeaways I'm going to have here today. This needs to happen. I, I'm talking uh, you know, specifically about what my experience has been the last 20 years working in the Caribbean diaspora and seeing the ebb and flow of these very committed networks and organizations of diaspora that become marginalized when political, you know, political parties fade or change or whatever else. I don't know if you want to add some more to that, Cynthia. I don't know. It sounds like that Venezuela is having a similar experience. No, definitely in, in the case of Venezuela, as I said, I mean, it was at some point, um, you know, it was even dangerous to operate even in the humanitarian space because of, you know, we were perceived as um, enemies, political enemies. So I think that, but, you know, there are a vague, I think that initiatives like um, DMAC, like these network bodies, is these international web networks, are a good entry point for, um, I think, for governments to feel more confident and also for the for diaspora groups to feel more confident to interact. If we have a sort of, um, let's say, let's call it arbiter, okay? So there is a kind of an interface between, there is not, not a direct uh, um, interaction between diaspora groups and, uh, and the government in case of hostile governments I'm talking about. No? So I think that, I, 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 there is a value in this uh, in these networks in these federations that, that are being set up uh, in, in that sense. No, in cases like ours, I just would like to add something that you know because you were talking about programs that were put in place um, here in the UK. Although there is a very nice document uh, that actually it Roberto in the, in the is in in your document that that you wrote about the uh, all parties parliamentary group for Venezuela. The truth is that. With all due respect to the Queen, they don't do a lot, okay? So we feel a little bit, um, you know, uh, quite lonely, let's put it that way. So what we have done in Healing Venezuela has been, our focus is humanitarian catastrophe in Venezuela. But what we have done is created um, a community here in the UK around a project that is called By Venezuelan. And by Venezuela, and it's basically an initiative, an initiative that we sponsor through a grant that we got from, uh, from um, uh, here. We, we sponsor small vendors, Venezuelan vendors of food, which is delicious, of services from dentists to, you know, TV, uh, movies, et cetera, et cetera. And through, through that network of entrepreneurs that we sponsor through our website with fairs with interviews and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We are creating a little bit of a community. 
So we don't have a, a, the role of a civil consulate because that's not the, the, the place, but we do have a, a program. We have created our own program for the Venezuelan community to have a place to, to be Venezuelans. Thank you very much for that. Um, are there any additional reflections for um, uh, Dr. Brown? Your hand is up, but you're muted. Oh, hi, can you hear me, Dr. Jenny? Yes, now we can. Okay. Uh, yes, I just wanted to comment on diaspora and politics. Um, I'm hearing somebody from my country. Yeah, so yes, you are. Yes, you are. Indeed. indeed. So it's, it's good to be on the same platform with you. Um, and yeah, sure. so just to introduce myself very briefly, I'm from the, I sit on the Global Jamaica Diaspora Council, which is actually a, a government forum, and I represent the UK um, North. Um, and in terms of politics in the diaspora, um, I think that um, this is a, this, this has always been a controversial topic, uh, especially from a Jamaica perspective, um, because there are some of us in the diaspora who believe that uh, members of the diaspora should be allowed the opportunity to vote. There was even recently a call for uh, a representative of the diaspora to sit in the Senate. And, and basically, there is a desire um, by some of us in the diaspora for greater political agency. Now, now, I represented you well, Kevin. I, I made those points. But you made I'm those glad points. you're here okay. to emphasize them even more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, 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 but, but the, the key thing here, Dr. Geneva and, and everyone, is that um, as controversial as some of these topics may be, the reality is that everything we do is influenced and controlled by politics. You know, your taxes are defined by a politician. Um, uh, you know, the, the laws are defined by politicians, uh, a government, uh, uh, a country's vision and outlook is defined by politicians. That's just how it is. So we cannot escape or run away from politics. And my observation is that um, the diaspora has very little political agency in their home countries. Um, so as much as we are welcome to respect to our economic um, sustenance that we provide. Uh, when it comes down to influencing politicians, my own observation, having been involved in the diaspora for many years, is that my influence remains limited because, because I can't vote. I cannot put any politician I interact with into office. And it means that during elections, during times of campaigns, there's very little there for the diaspora to look at to say that represents me. So I think that um, diaspora engagement in, in the political affairs of the homeland has to happen. And I, I know some case studies were presented earlier, whether, whether it's the French model, where you have um, parliamentarian or Senate representatives, I think that could be a, 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 a progressive step for other countries. Yeah, let, me, let me interrupt you just to bring you back to, there is a session that speaks to political capital this session speaks to social capital, but I am interested in your point, which is that politics guides everything. And this is not, I, I think there's relevance not only for the Caribbean, but perhaps for all of the emerging countries. The question is, should there, we're shaping policy now. This discussion is to help Roberto and his team, you know, shape policy. So the question is, are there any thoughts, recommendations, reflections? on what we can be recommending from the government standpoint with respect to how to address and engage around more social capital, engage our people. Are there any policy questions? So far, what has been offered is the importance of networks, that there needs to be more support by the government on networks, that there needs to be a sense of neutrality so that people can feel free to participate without any political overtones. So socially engaged in a neutral space. Uh, another point was leadership, the importance of leadership, uh, you know, that will encourage and build these networks so social capital can flow. So just to remind you that we're focused on social capital. Is it your view, my, my question, is it your view that although you're, if there's no political influence, can we recommend that there ought to be in, in order to drive more social engagement? 
that if the aspirants felt that they had more, you know, stake in the discussion politically, if that would drive them more socially. That that's kind of the question coming out of, you know, what you're saying. I don't know how the panelists yes. feel about that. Well, I, I agree with you that, that yes, that, that's exactly where I was heading with this, is that you need the political agency to influence the social change. Because the, the thing, Dr. Geneva, and I'm sure you've observed this over the years, is that the diaspora is engaged in a lot of social development in our homelands, right? The diaspora is doing so much in terms of community intervention work, um, you know, in, in a lot of uh, inner city deprived uh, eras in Jamaica, for example, and I'm sure that's the same uh, globally. So in terms of social change and social impact, the diaspora has definitely uh, been a, a contributor. But, but, the, but, but the nuance I'm adding to the conversation is that you, if we had greater political agency, then even better. Because my observation, Dr. Geneve, is that we're not, while, we're, while we are supporting uh, social change, we're not influencing social policy, right? So, 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 for example, when the government decides to introduce a social policy of any nature, right? They, they don't. I, I don't see them proactively saying, "Well, we must get, we must get Dr. Geneva in the room, or we must get the diaspora around the table." You know, they, so so all these policies are being developed, uh, but we're not there. But in the end, we're still having this huge social impact, and I'm just saying that. The next frontier for the diaspora would be to influence policy, and you perhaps need the political agents to do that. Very fine, very fine. We are at one minute before this aspect uh, is concluded. Are there any final comments? Mm -hmm. uh, apologies, but there, there's a couple of comments in the chat box. I don't know if we'd like to share those. Uh, you remember that um, we had our technical person who said she was going to put it in the question sheet, and I've been looking at that. All right. Yeah, I, it seems like that didn't happen, um, right. but so I'm happy to share them, them for you. If you could take them, please, that'd be helpful. Yeah, so we have um, from Suela Kalia, who spoke earlier. She mentions that some of the things that can be done are incentives, um, embrace financial knowledge exchange programs, as well as engage qualified returnees as key advisors, to also to set up consultation platforms, set up professionals network platforms. And then we have another comment from Melanie Salame. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, that says inclusion of diaspora organizations in policy making, especially on policies addressing diaspora issues and stakes, reinforcing the role of country representative, sorry, uh, re representative institutions in host countries and build a bridge between diaspora communities and origin government assisting and allocating resources to build diaspora structures to be able to represent their interests and needs. And I might just add uh, in the chat, I also put a link to the iDiaspora platform which is uh, a global resource and networking hub on diaspora, uh, which we've been working on for a few years. Um, a bit in response also to Kingsley's comment about having a, a sort of one-stop shop for all diaspora, which is what we're aiming to achieve. That's all we have in the chat for now. Thanks. I really enjoyed that discussion, all of them today. That was brilliant. Thank you all. We have our um, next question, which is going to be about partnership and we'll discuss this for 20 minutes as uh, per usual, who are the key actors to partner with governments to increase impact in engagement of diaspora social capital? And how can the future agenda document support such partnerships? Who are the key actors to partner with governments to increase impact in engagement of diaspora social capital? And how can the future agenda document support such partnerships? Uh, it is now 12.57. We have 20 minutes, so that would take us to 1.17, right? Who wants to jump out? Professor Balasu has her hand. Professor yes. Balasu? Yes. Please. Actually, it's interesting that what I was going to say concerning the political uh, neutrality fits into this 
discussion. So let me just combine. I was going to say that among the Ghanaian diaspora, on the other hand, they have political parties at their destinations. The political parties we have in the country have their wings at their destination. So depending on who is in power, one is very active, the other is dormant. We have a more or less a two-party state. And they offer all kinds of advice and also uh, engage the government. They engage the government, I should say. So we should look at the engagement in two ways. Either the government is, is engaging or the diaspora themselves try to engage the government, especially when they want to look at philanthropy. Um, they may want to show themselves as an organization to be recognized. So um, governments may have to just manage these parties which are outside as a social capital for itself to do a number of things. Once they are peaceful, once they don't have any conflicts amongst themselves, I think it is okay because people are political in nature. You cannot say that when they are at their destination, they should not have anything to do with politics. If it's managed, if it's managed, it's possible that the wings will be there and um, they know when they should be quiet and when they should talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh if there are no other comments right now, I'd like to just offer my own. Um, Dr. Badasu hits a point, uh, just as Kevin did, uh, with respect to people are political animals. And, and that, you know, you have to be cautious about these groups who may be bad actors. One of the areas I know in my own experience uh, we should consider are organizations, nonprofits, as we call them in America, tax exempt organizations are hosted or being run by members of the diaspora that are not up to date with their financial reporting. Uh, in this period when there is high scrutiny for uh, organizations that are repatriating funds overseas across borders, that kind of activity is under strict scrutiny in the, certainly since uh, you know twenty uh, since, since the the bombing of the of the, of the um, in New York since nine eleven, and it is important that these organizations that are coming to the fore and representing diaspora groups that they be up to date in their fiduciary oversight filings tax filings. Otherwise, they will be slammed by the U.S. government. So. Here's a scenario. An entity has been raising money, has not filed its papers, decides it's going to jump out there and begin to deal with you know, diaspora issues, try to engage with government across borders in solving problem A, problem B, problem C. The next thing you know, they get a letter that they have not done their filing. Could be worse that they're in some jeopardy because monies are being mismanaged, misused. This provides a level of risk to the government um, that it does not want. Because although the governments themselves are not responsible for this, to the extent that they're aligned with or working with or collaborating with this organization, they're in the soup. So there needs to be some way to provide oversight, some structure, some requirement that these organizations are up to date and maintain their uh, you know, regulatory requirements in the host country in order to qualify, to participate and to utilize. I know with the case of Jamaica, you could be invited to an event and you see the Consul General's logo on this invitation without approval, things like that. It becomes very messy. You cannot you know, use the government's icons on your documents, on your invitations without getting approval. Should anything happen that's nefarious or difficult financially or otherwise, the government is now seen as a partner in this exercise. It becomes a problem. So I, you know, I'm not a lover of big government. I'm not. But I think 
in this area, there needs to be tidier, a tidier way to, to manage this and to reduce the risk, risk assessment where government is concerned. Yes, Kingsley. You're muted. It's a phrase of the year, isn't it? You're muted. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, that's all uh, important stuff. Um, but just thinking back to the, the question of the, who, are the, the, who are the key actors to partner with government to increase the impact to engage. I mean, the players out there right now would be government. We've talked about that. Will be NGOs and um, non-government organisations. We mentioned that. There'd be foundations, um, and they're certainly out there as potential partners. Um, and then there's high net worth individuals. And what we're seeing, uh, particularly in the United States now, is an explosion of wealth at the high end. In fact, Accenture did a report that said that between now and 2050, um, 30 trillion dollars will be transferred intergenerationally. So the intergenerational transfer of wealth is this phenomenon, this tsunami coming down the tracks. Um, and it's going to be gigantic. Now, that money is going to go three places. It's going to go to children. Kids are going to inherit a lot of money. But a lot of people don't want to give all their money to their kids because you destroy them. If it doesn't go there, the second option, it goes to the government and tax. Most people don't want to do that. The third option is you give it away. And that's why philanthropy is soaring. The Harvard just raised 10 billion. The universities are good at this. Hospitals are good at this. But diaspora groups are good at this too. And when you think of the structures in America right now, and I'm sure remember, you remember, Jenny, when you, when you were in New York, the emergence of donor-advised funds within the banking system. So the biggest 501c3 public charity in the United States last year, for the first time ever, was a bank, Fidelity with their donor advised funds. And what you have in America is a million, over a million donor advised funds with just think of it, $180 billion in these funds. And they can only be used on charitable philanthropic organizations and they can be used overseas. They can be used back in Jamaica or Scotland or New Zealand. There are ways of doing that. So I think there's a very exciting vista there opening up. Um, and that is about building those relationships, et cetera. But I think to answer the question, I think there's one final piece of the jigsaw missing. And I hope over the next decade, they really engage with the diaspora space. And that's the corporate world. That's the major corporates, the IBMs, the Microsofts, the Apples, et cetera. They haven't yet really grasped this topic. And I think we need a kind of a nearly like a SWAT team to make the case to corporate America that this is big business. Diaspora equals jobs, diaspora equals potential, export potential and commercial, commercial opportunities in this space. I think they, they are the weak actors at the moment. And that's the possibility, an exciting possibility. And, and you can see it in airlines are beginning to realize it increasingly. You can see it in um, tourist related uh, corporates, et cetera. But, but in terms of the high tech uh, sector, we don't really see it. In the pharma sector, don't really see it. The biosciences don't really see it. But there's a job of work to be done there. And I think there's some opportunities there. Very interesting. Roberto. Thank you. Actually, I see Dr. Kevin Brown had his hand up first. He can go first and I'll follow. That's okay. I'm so sorry. It's not on the screen here. No, no problem. Thank you, Roberta. I, I, um, Dr. Geneva, I just wanted to, to come in quickly on the point you're making, because I think it's an important one. Um, whereas oftentimes, you know, we, we look at the diaspora and say the diaspora uh, gives back so much to our home countries. But, but yes, there are concerns around the quality of uh, diaspora associations and the leadership integrity behind some of them. And, and I think one, one way we could resolve that um, is, is if the consulates and embassies got more involved in diaspora associations with respect to capacity building, um, because I am observing a, a growing deficit uh, in terms of uh, capacity building for diaspora associations. And, and I think this is where the government now needs to get more involved with respect to their, their regional consulates and embassies and trying to sort of make sure that they have a grip on, first of all, uh, knowing uh, these associations and who's leading them and what are they actually contributing to their home country. Um, so somehow we've got to, when we talk about mapping, mapping uh, definitely is not about mapping the individual diaspora. It's also about mapping diaspora associations and then also tracking and trying to quantify what are they actually doing, you know, and, and some of them are doing really, really good work, but, but you know, uh, we, we're not able to quantify their social impact. 
Um, you know, so I think those are some of the key things. And, and, and mapping, I would argue, mapping diaspora associations is actually easier than mapping individuals. So that's definitely a low hanging fruit that lots of governments should perhaps try and grab first. And then once you map them, you should then engage them to make sure that they are of the highest integrity that you desire. Thank you very much. We are at 107. Um, we uh, are here until 130. We don't necessarily have to use all the time, uh, but we're guided by the level of engagement uh, that we have here. Um, are there any further comments on this matter so, before we go to wrap up? Roberto, are you seeing one in the chat? Yeah, there, there's some comments in the chat. And actually, I wanted to make a quick comment. Actually, Dr. Brown stole my comment um, about the, the need for following on your comment, uh, Dr. Geneva, on, on the need for governments to actually engage in capacity building of their interlocutors to, to ensure exactly what you mentioned, that they are up to the high standard. And I think uh, the point on, on doing the mapping is also very critical. And, and it's interesting because it came up also in the last technical working group I was uh, participating in on human capital the need, need for data and information. Um, so I think it is something that obviously resonates across the different areas of task for engagement. Um, and if you permit me, I'll, I'll share some of the comments quickly. Um, Suela Kalia mentions in terms of partners, uh, consulates and embassies. I think we see them coming up quite often. She says they are also actors which should serve as to contact and enhance diaspora engagement. Till now, their role in this, in this direction has been limited and unexplored. Um, there are several comments in agreement with uh, Kingsley in terms of the uh, role of private sector. And... Okay. Um, and then Sofia Orozco says, uh, that from Mexico, we have the um, Red Consular Mexicana, which is a community consul, which works to link the Mexican community with their Mexican origin. Um, and then Professor Padasu says, yes, it is easier to map and engage the associations and the individuals. And maybe I would just add to that often, the associations are the gatekeepers to the individuals. So once you know the associations, they can actually open doors to their membership and help you reach them. And another comment just came in from Shaylee Nunez. She says, certainly the work with, uh, with diaspora associations facilitates implementation of national policies um, that benefit the diaspora and the promotion of, of the promotion of and the promotion of, of information of interest. Sorry, I was translating from Spanish. Um, on the fly. Um, and I see there, there's a lot of messages coming in. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Cynthia mentions for those diasporas that are orphaned because our country of origin doesn't engage with us, it's important to have an instance that gives us credibility and visibility. Amira Ayeti says, great points all, just something to add for the home government to consider that the decisive and comprehensive reforms are needed in home countries, not focused on specific sectors or group, but on the overall system to create a framework where domestic entrepreneurs, diaspora members, and foreign investors all see the home country as a model for economic growth and a place where they can and want to do business. And that's all we have for now. If you don't mind, I'd like to pick up on a point Kingsley made because really he threw us a bone with respect to the potential partner that is at this point underutilized, and that's corporations. I would be curious to find out from you, Kingsley, whether uh, such 
increased engagement might be tied to uh, their bottom line, company's bottom line. I run a foundation called the American Caribbean Maritime Foundation. And for the first time, we're seeing the engagement of cruise and cargo companies, shipping companies, involved in education like we never did before. And basically what the foundation does is goes to them and tells them that we're training your, you know, we're training your next crew, everyone from, you know, and on the professional side. No trouble finding the maintenance crew, the chefs, the cooks, the cleanup people. Nothing wrong with those jobs. But the, the engineers, the maritime engineers, the logisticians, the captains, that's where we are training them. And we're, the companies are saying, no one ever approached us before. Yeah, you can help us, you know, find these people out of the Caribbean. We'll help you train them. We'll give you the money to fund the scholarships. And once they graduate, we'll get them jobs. As a result, we ended, ended up launching a jobs board two weeks ago to facilitate this exercise. So my question would be, is it that the opportunity with corporations is more focused on their business, their bottom line? I would say that the shift, the great shift we've seen is a move from shareholder power to stakeholder power. And stakeholders includes customers, employees, and includes things like the environment and the, the and climate. And I think that's the big tsunami coming down the track is obviously climate change is one of the great black swan events of our time with Ukraine and with COVID. These are three massive unexpected events that had gigantic implications. And don't think that we won't have more of them, you know, in the future, we will. So I think that ESG, you know, which is now going to be such a driver and the fact that the pension funds in the world, and that's trillions and trillions of dollars are now saying we're only going to invest our money in companies that have social and governance policies they never had that before and i think what's going to happen just like like happened in the 1920s when you couldn't compare company to company because you couldn't compare their accounts and they introduced gap accounting they introduced the securities controls etc so that actually we could now judge companies for stock exchange reasons you could compare companies i think that's going to happen again now but it'll be on on judging companies on their performance for their stakeholders, which is the environment and which is, you know, the culture of society and community, all those areas. And I think there's opportunities in that for, for diaspora groups and for diaspora uh, initiatives and policies and programs. Um, and I think the, the chances... Is it more, is it more in the mercenary or is it also very strongly tied to, to their bottom line, their shareholders, well, you know? I, I think it's completely tied to their bottom line. But the, the power now, the power has shifted. Like the next generation coming forward, like I look at my kids, they've got a totally different way of viewing companies and their performance and the way they, they check them out and the way they won't, you know, they won't buy, use coffee out of a paper cup and all that kind of stuff. They've got power and that's the consumer at that level is shifting and having an impact. So these companies for their own survival will do this. So yes, it's driven, of course, by, by bottom line self-interest, but it could be a win-win. You know, not purely a win for them, but also a win for the rest of us. I think that that's where corporates who step forward will be re will be rewarded by the consumer. Any further comments before we close? Uh, Roberto, I'm guided by you. I see Dr. Brown's hand is still up. I don't know if it's an old hand or if he has another comment. Dr. Brown? Kevin Brown? You're muted. Oops, if you'd like to speak. It, it, it's an old, it's an old hand, but but okay. uh, just, but I'll make a, a quick comment nonetheless. On um, in terms of my observation, um, the, the 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 final thing I just note is that uh, the the private sector has played a role um, both in the country and, and in the diaspora. Um, the, the, the the private sector has has a it, well, just my observation, and I guess it, it and it's a Jamaican example. Uh, has been reasonably philanthropic, but but fundamentally, um, one of the things I've noticed in terms of social intervention and social change is that um, even at a government level, it's not all joint, it's not always joined up, and you'll find that various ministries and departments of government will be doing their own initiatives without communicating with each other, trying to fix cer certain social deficits within the country. And then on top of that is the diaspora who comes in as well. And so <laughs> and so what I've observed sometimes is that you can have a multi, multiple players trying to solve the same social problem, 
government departments who don't talk to each other, and then and then multiple individuals and associations of diaspora as well. You know, and, and I'm sure if you go into certain communities in Jamaica, they'll tell you that yes, you know, various stakeholders are coming into uh, my community trying to help. Um, so uh, one big challenge is how do you get that all coordinated? You know, and that that can be difficult, and sometimes that can also face resistance from the diaspora. Because if the government tries to coordinate it, then the diaspora says, well, the government's interfering. So um, it, it's, a, it's a really tricky one, but, but I still find it um, a challenge when you don't have a coordination around that sort of social intervention, because, it, because then how do you know what success, success looks like? You know, and, and that's the challenge. So, yeah, th- th- there is that ongoing problem, I think, where, you know, how do you get a sort of coordinated shared outcome from these social initiatives. That's always sometimes difficult to achieve. Well, I don't know about you all, but for me, this was very illuminating. I learned so much from each and every one of you. I want to thank Roberto for inviting me and Kingsley. I'm sure you had a lot to do with that. Good to see you and glad that uh, you're doing such a ma- continuing to do such amazing, amazing work in the diaspora community. I want to connect with you because I want to talk with you further on the corporate side um, where I agree with you. There's tremendous opportunity. Thanks to all the presenters and attendees for your support and input. It has really, truly been an honor for me. Uh, to work with you all. And thank you to Stefan Angheister in Germany for hosting uh, this important session, which has put, at least for me in sharp focus, the emerging dynamics of the rich global diaspora experience and the remarkable thought leadership coming out of what only a few years ago was in its nascent uh, stages. My uh, summary observations are really quite a few, um, but I think hope they are concise. One is political neutrality. We really need to figure that out, um, uh, think through on the policy side, how we can, in layman terms, get governments to stand down and let the diaspora, let their diaspora rip without any feeling that, uh, you know, it's a partisan exercise. Another one is the importance of leadership and uh, leadership uh, integrity are really very key. Uh, Another one is that there needs to be increased commitment by government to support diaspora, not only talking that support, but walking that support, possibly with the secretariat, with types of funding, with ensuring that these groups have a place at the table, uh, a point that Kevin made in terms of decisions and policy, whether it's economic, political, or social. And the final one is the business of the great opportunity with corporations that are doing business in these countries and getting them to engage with the diaspora. Uh, of course, with being mindful that for them, they're running a business and their shareholders uh, you know, are important, but that they are the new uh, pioneer, they're the new frontier, let's uh, say, uh, in terms of support and diaspora partnerships. Um, please feel free to add any additional points, uh, Roberto or anyone else, if I have missed any of the big points uh, on this uh, matter. Um, I think I we have gone through uh, everything. Uh, I want to thank you again for uh, coming. I don't know whether my next step is to hang on with Roberto or what, but I'm sure you will guide me. Philippe, maybe we just pass the word to Stefan for uh, closing from his side. That's right. Stefan, I thanked you, but I did not pass the gavel to you. Thank you, my friend. No, that's that's all right. And I think uh, I have nothing to add. I mean, your 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 summary was quite concise and I think uh, shed light on, on the different perspectives and views that we've engaged today. Uh, one takeaway maybe that I, I want to add is, is that um, for me, it, it's always quite helpful to learn the um, the difference of perspective on diaspora engagement when it comes to um, diaspora engagement um, from say from, from my perspective is mostly focused on engaging with diaspora from other countries of origin here in Germany 
and that's a completely different um, perspective uh, comparing to as the German government engaging with German diaspora abroad. So that's that's uh, that's uh, something that I think we shed a lot of light on today, and that was quite helpful for me. Um, and uh, it was an it was a pleasure hosting today. Thank you, Janine, for your for your smooth moderating um, and your and your um, and your running a tight ship in terms of the schedule today. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. It was my honor and my pleasure indeed. Safe safe everyone. Um, there is some kind of a minor, you know, uh, Omicron coming, but I know that I pray that this will be minor and that we will all remain safe. Godspeed. Take good care and all blessings. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody.